Happy Easter, community. Since it's Easter, I need you to help me with something. We don't have a lot of traditions around here, but we do have an Easter tradition. And, and here's what we do on Easter Sunday. I say, Christ is risen. And you'll respond with real Easter enthusiasm. He is risen indeed. And as a part of our community online, when I say Christ is risen, wherever you are in the world, you can either say it out loud or go ahead and just type it in the chat. Type in the chat, he is risen indeed. And, and this is a tradition we've taken from the historic Orthodox Church. And this was something that they would say every Easter, no matter what. Uh, if there was a war, they'd say, he is risen indeed. If there was a famine, they'd proclaim, he is risen indeed. If there was a pandemic, they'd say together, he is risen indeed. Amidst political chaos, they'd shout, he is risen indeed. It was a declaration of hope that they had uh, a faith in the face of any fear. He is risen indeed. So I'm gonna ask the production team here to do it with me. Are you ready? Here we go. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Okay, one more time, like it's a matter of life or death. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I wanna start by sharing a story with you. And it's about my friend, uh, Slavic Pish. He leads a Christian college of about 3,000 students in the Ukraine, most of whom were training for church leadership. Uh, last year, we got to be together in Berlin and we stayed up late into the night just talking. He, he told me about that early morning on February 24th, two years ago, when Russia invaded his country. He said it was a day of total chaos. He told me he could literally hear the missiles flying over the house where he and his family live. Most people began to run, escaping to neighboring countries. Uh, many business leaders, political leaders, church leaders, pastors fled the country immediately. He told me he was scared, like everybody else. But while feeling the fear, he sent out an email to his staff telling them that there would be a 7 a.m. meeting the very next morning, February 25th. The next morning, he gathered his team together and he told them, we got work to do. We have people to serve, and God has us here for a reason. And starting that day, not only did they continue to train church leaders, but they turned that college into a refugee shelter. About 250 women and children would come through every day, escaping the carnage of war. They would give them shelter, they give them a bed to sleep in, they give them food to eat, and then they'd send them off to Poland to safety. I asked Slavic, who is probably one of the most courageous people I've ever met, what gave you the courage to stay? And he told me this, and I wrote it down so I could remember it. He said, I live in a reality where darkness and hopelessness are everywhere. I'm constantly scared. But for me, it's the resurrection that gives me a concrete hope in everyday life that the evil we face constantly, in spite of everything, will not prevail. And because I know the resurrected Christ, I have a hope and I know I have a future. I want you to hold on to that. Some people fled in fear, but some found hope to face the fear. What I want us to do next, I want us to go back to that very first Easter morning. Because on that very first Easter morning, some fled in fear, and some found a very real hope in the face of their fear. Mark tells the story of that first Easter, and he says this, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? Okay, so, so Mark begins this scene on Easter Sunday with three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. And we, we need to pause right there just for a second because in the ancient world, this is quite incredible. And why is it incredible? Because the ancient world didn't value the witness of women. Their testimony would, would, wouldn't have been viewed as, as credible. So it's really quite fascinating that Mark starts his account about the most important event of the Christian faith with the testimony of three women. Why did he do that? Well, as some scholars have wisely pointed out, the only reason Mark would do this is because that's what actually happened. Mary, 
Mary and Salome set out to anoint the dead body of Jesus with spices. And we're told they did this just after sunrise. Okay, why then? Well, likely they were worried about being harassed, perhaps harassed by the Roman guards. So they hoped to get there before anyone else arrived or anyone else was awake. So one concern was the Roman guards, but the other concern the women voiced was, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? Because likely the stone, okay, in front of the tomb weighed several hundred pounds. Now, now all this points out something else, and it's kind of this, like, where were the guys? <laughs> the male disciples. I mean, they could have protected them. Maybe they could have rolled away the stone. Where were they? Now, while that's interesting, that's another message for another time because that's not even close to being the most surprising part of the story. Let's look at verses four and five. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. All right, okay, wow, here we go. The stone was already rolled away. They weren't expecting that. And sitting there inside the tomb was a young man dressed in a white robe. And it says the women were alarmed. Now, when it says alarmed, the Greek just as well have been translated. They were totally freaked out or they were scared to death. And why were they scared to death? Because it was an angel. Now, maybe when you think of an angel, you think of a cute little baby cherub with wings, all right? No. Instead, what I need you to think of, think of a being whose countenance is radiating the glory of God, whose eyes kind of glow with the ability to spot evil and injustice wherever it is, whose voice has a thundering echo with the authority of someone who is just with God. See, in the Bible, an angel's mere presence instilled this profound sense of awe, fear, and trembling. And that is exactly what these women felt. So what happens next? Well, the angel speaks to them and says, don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Okay, so the angels walk them off the ledge and say, and say, don't be afraid. And then the angel gives them clear instructions. Go tell the other disciples to take a road trip to Galilee where they will see Jesus, who now is alive. So what I want you to do is I want you to put yourself in the shoes of these women for a moment. Okay, three days ago, you saw Jesus die. But now, here you are in this empty tomb and an angel. And remember, I mean an angel is sitting in the empty tomb and he gives you clear instructions to go tell the other disciples that Jesus is alive. So what do you do? What do you think these women do? Well, here's how Mark ends the story. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. They did nothing. They said nothing. They were too afraid. What? Wait, I mean, that's it? Yep, that's the end of the, end of the story. Happy Easter, everybody. Let's, let's pray, and then you can all just go home. Look at it. It says, trembling and bewildered, the women fled, saying nothing to anyone. Because why? Because they were afraid. I, I want you to imagine this morning that this really was the end of the story. That bewildered, the women said nothing to anyone because they were so afraid. And I want you to imagine that because the more I've thought about it, the more I've realized that for many of us, this is where our Easter's often end for us. And here's what I mean. For many of us, it's Easter, right? It's Easter, so we show up at church. We hear the Easter story. We shout, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And too often, we leave here afraid. We do nothing different. We say nothing different. 
We leave afraid of the same stuff we are afraid of before Easter. Nothing's changed. For too many Easter's, far too many Easter's, perhaps like these women, we hear the resurrection story, we take it in with our ears and our eyes, but we leave here the same, the same way we showed up, afraid. See, see, so much of life, our whole life, is spent being afraid and being driven by fear. I mean, think about a lifespan. When we first emerge from the warmth of our mother's womb into the cold cosmos, we cry as babies because we're afraid. We're afraid of the unknown. And then a few years later, we go off to school. And whether the first step is onto a bus, or the first step is into a classroom full of strangers, we're afraid. Afraid of being rejected. And then for the next 12 years, it's this ongoing process of feeling afraid. Afraid of not having friends, afraid of being left out, afraid of looking stupid. And then when school finally ends, we begin to look for a job, but the search for the job has its own set of fears. We're afraid that we might not get the job we really want. And if we get the job we want, we're afraid we might not be able to do the job. And along the way, fear is so much a part of love and romance. We're afraid we're not gonna find the right someone. And then once we find someone, we're afraid it won't last. And along the way, we're afraid we might not be able to have kids. And then once we have kids, we're afraid we're going to screw them up. Right? And of course, the greatest fear of every Chicagoan, that Caleb Williams may not be a great quarterback. <laughs> All right, seriously. So much of life, from beginning to end, is spent being afraid and being driven by fear. And all of us come here today with very real fears. What are yours? What are your fears? Afraid to get the test results back? Afraid of running out of money? Afraid of being hurt? Again. Afraid of being alone. Afraid to die. I mean, so much of life is spent being afraid and being driven by fear. It's interesting, a couple of years ago, Chapman University did a national study on fear, and what they discovered is that we Americans are much like those three women on that first Easter. We struggle tremendously with fear. The study estimates that as high as 85% of the U.S. population lives with an impending sense of doom. 85%. And quick, quick sidebar, okay? Any guesses what our number one fear is? The number one fear of Americans right now? Corrupt government politicians. 62% of all Americans said that what they feared most ahead of a fear of death or a fear of illness or a fear of financial hardship was corrupt government politicians. And I'll tell you, as we move forward in, into this election year, I get it. But know this, and please hear me on this. The clickbait of social media and the breaking news of cable TV, it's all designed to make you feel afraid and keep you feeling afraid. And remember this, especially on Easter, our hope is not in a political party or a politician. Our hope is in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. So let's go back to Mark, Mark 16, 8, and that first Easter. It says, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And again, here's my very real concern for me and for you, that many of us, like the women, we show up on Easter. You hear the resurrection story, but you leave here the same way you showed up, afraid. So what could make this Easter different? What could make this Easter different? I think I know. In fact, I'm sure I know. It's the same thing that made that first Easter different. For you see, the story didn't actually end there in verse 8 of Mark 16 with the women being afraid. If we keep reading, it describes what happens next in verse 9. In verse 9, it says, When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of who he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. 
Okay, what happened there? What happened? I mean, now a moment ago, the women were trembling and bewildered and afraid. And now here is Mary with a bold faith, a real hope, and she's telling everybody about the resurrection. What, what changed? What was the difference? If you look closely, the difference was simply this. The difference was an encounter with Jesus. She didn't just hear the resurrection story. She actually encountered the resurrected Jesus. See, having a personal encounter with Jesus gave her hope in the face of fear. I don't think I'd even say that Mary wasn't afraid. I think she was like my friend Slavic. She feels the fear, but she has a hope that's greater. I love how it says, she went and told those who'd been with him and who were mourning and weeping. People who had been fearful and afraid were now being given hope by the very person who was also afraid, Mary. Do you know what the most frequent command in the Bible is? Do you know what instruction, what order is given again and again and again by, by God, by angels, by Jesus, by the prophets, by the apostles? Do you know what it is? Be good. No, that's not it. Be holy. No, that's not it. Don't use sin. No, that's not it, okay? The, the most frequent command in the Bible is this. Do not be afraid. That simple phrase, or of do not be afraid, or sometimes it's translated fear not, is spoken in God's word more than any other single phrase. In fact, I read one place that this command shows up 365 times in the Bible. It's like one time for every day of the year because God knew we would need it. And please hear me on this. I believe if there was one thing Jesus would say to you and me, it's this. Fear not. Whatever it is that you're going through, there's no need to be afraid. Mary was afraid, but then she had this personal encounter with Jesus and discovered a hope that was greater than any fear. All of this makes me think of another woman from right here at Community who found hope in the face of her fear. Here's Angel's story. My name is Angel Zaper. I have two children, Michael, who is nine, Marlena is four, and I've been attending Community for two years. Last August, I woke up, I felt very dizzy, a little off, and then I lost hearing in my ear, and I had this like loud ringing going on. I'm like, maybe I just needed to eat something. And then the dizziness continued throughout the entire day. Once I met with my ENT and he sent me for an MRI is when I found out that I have a brain tumor that was about three centimeters. It was so hard for me because there were so many moments that I feared dying because of leaving my kids. So Wednesday before surgery, I dropped my daughter off at daycare and I bawled in the car because I was like, this might be the last time I see her. And then I took my son bowling. If this is my last memory with him, I want it to be fun. You don't remember a lot coming out of surgery, but I just remember coming, waking up and just saying, thank you, God, like we made it. <laughs> we made it on the other side of this. There was a lot of moments where I would just break down and cry in my living room after I got my kids to school and just tell him, like, I surrender. I surrender all my fear. I surrender all my worries. Like, I need you to, like, comfort me and, and I need to strengthen my faith right now and, and be there for me. And there were so many ways that God kept showing me, like, random ways. I would be, I would go to the gym and meet somebody who's brother went through like the same surgery of this very rare tumor that I that I had and people from the church who were either dropping off meals or having meals provided for me making sure my kids were okay picking up my oldest son to take him out the house to have some fun um, helping with pickups drop offs and my small group we don't miss a day without saying a prayer for each other and checking on each other and it was um, it was probably the most love I've ever felt in my life he continues to show me that he's he shows up for me. And that's just an overwhelming feeling to feel like somebody so amazing just loves you. You know, as humans, we tend to like feel like life can be so hard and so much is weighing on us and we go through so much. Like when you think about what Jesus did for us, 
he gave his life for us and the resurrection of that, like just how powerful that is, that somebody can go through that for loving us the way that he does, is just beyond like what we can even imagine. To have that faith and that knowing that whatever his will is for you will be done is, it gives you a different type of comfort to just be alive on this earth. Isn't that amazing? I mean, see what an encounter with Jesus can do, especially when it's supported by Jesus' people? The more I've thought about this scene from the Gospel of Mark, the more confident I am that what we all need is not just once again to hear the resurrection story. What we need is to have an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. So I want to lead us in a guided prayer. Because prayer is how we encounter God or how we meet with Jesus. And I want to invite you to use your imagination as we pray. To allow yourself to imagine what it would be like to be Mary. Encountering Jesus at the empty tomb. And, and, and don't worry, it's, it's not going to get weird or uncomfortable. But I am going to ask you, just go ahead and just kind of just relax. Um, close your eyes. And allow your mind to explore this scene I'm going to describe from the first Easter. So go ahead and just close your eyes as we do this prayerfully together. Holy Spirit, we ask you to join us and take us back to that first Easter in our mind's eye. I want you to imagine yourself waking up early to go to the tomb. You get dressed. You pick up the basket of spices that you've prepared for the tomb. You step out into the rising sunshine and you can feel the breeze on your face as you start the short walk to the place where you saw them bury Jesus. As you're walking, you feel your eyes begin to water and a lump in your throat as you remember watching him die. As you listen to the sounds of your footsteps on the dirt road, all you feel is fear. Fear about what it'll be like to live on your own without him. Fear about all the needs you have that you were hoping Jesus was going to meet. Fear they may come after you like they came after him. Fear about all the ways life has gone wrong. And as you approach the tomb, it all feels too overwhelming. Just outside the tomb, you, you, you can't keep your composure any longer, and there are, there are tears. But in the middle of this emotion, you hear a voice. It's a man behind you who's asking, excuse me, why are you crying? And through your tears, you get out. Can you just tell me where you've taken him? Where have you taken Jesus? At this point, there's a silent pause. And then you hear your name. You hear your name. In your own imagination, just hear your own name in that space. And in that moment, you realize it's him, it's Jesus. And he's alive. And then you turn and you look, and it is him. He's standing right there, the one you thought was dead, the one who's now alive. He's right there. And he knows you. He loves you. He, he, he said your name.
And it's Jesus, the one who rose from the dead for you. And as you stand there in that moment, standing before Jesus, I want to pause for just a moment to listen. What is it that Jesus wants to say to you? What does Jesus say to you? Jesus speaks to you. What is he saying? Because now in this moment, you're having a conversation with Jesus. But as your awareness returns from there to this room, the here and now, What does Jesus have to say to you about today? About what you fear the most? What is Jesus telling you? Amen. Amen. See, um, this Easter, like the first Easter, and every Easter since, you'll either leave here with the fear you brought with you, or you'll leave here with a hope that is greater than any fear. On that first Easter, when these women only heard the resurrection story, they just heard the story, they left in fear. But once they had an encounter with Jesus, they left with a faith and a hope that was greater than any fear. Let me ask you about what just happened. As you were praying, did you feel a sense of hope? If you did, that was Jesus. As you were praying, did you notice that you didn't think about what you were afraid of? If that happened, that was because of an encounter with Jesus. As you were praying or any time during the service, did you notice that you were moved with emotion that you don't normally feel? If that happened, you had an encounter with Jesus. And please understand, a single encounter with the resurrected Jesus can give you a renewed confidence about the hope you have, not only for this life, but for the next. So, one more time, let's proclaim the resurrection hope that we have in the face of any fear. Are you ready? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.